Imelda Keenan, a 22-year-old woman engaged to Mark Wall, her partner of six years. Mark frequently stayed over at Imelda's second-story, bedsit type flat, though officially he still lived with his parents. Imelda, known for her adventurous spirit, had moved to Waterford at the age of 15, having fallen in love with the place after many visits throughout her youth. She had always said this is what she would do, and she did. Initially living with her two brothers, Ned and Jerry, she completed her education in the Mercy Convent in Waterford. She then went and lived with another brother, Michael, in Cork for a while, but Waterford called her back and she found her own place on Williams Street, close to the Quays in Waterford City. With her beloved cat, she called Felix. Despite her independent lifestyle, family remained a vital part of Imelda's life. She maintained a close contact with her brothers, also writing home frequently. As the Christmas season approached in December 1993, Imelda, usually a regular visitor to her mother's home in County Leash, decided to stay in Waterford this year. She had meticulously prepared for the holidays with presents under her Christmas tree for her beloved nephews and presents for her under her Christmas tree too. She had a wreath ready to place on her father's grave and heartfelt Christmas cards had been sent to family and close friends. However, in a bizarre turn of events, Imelda's brother Ned discovered an eerie silence when he visited her bedside on Christmas Eve. Lights were on, but there was no response at the door. He hung around for about an hour to see if she showed up, but there was no Imelda. Although unsettled, he didn't dwell on it during the festive season, assuming Imelda was caught up in Christmas celebrations. The real shock came on the bank holiday Monday, January 3rd, when Mark, Imelda's fiancé, reached out to Ned, claiming Imelda was missing. Strangely, Mark mentioned speaking with her just three, three and a half hours before. The confusion mounted, leading to a night of searching. That evening, Imelda Keenan, 22 years old, would be officially reported missing to the Irish police, not by Mark, her fiancé, but by her perplexed brother Ned. None of this made any sense. I think you'll see why. Today's case presents numerous red flags. Again. With no one held accountable, no trace of Imelda and a suspicious lack of cooperation, her family has unearthed new information. Will their findings be enough to elevate this case to a murder inquiry? I'm Louise. This is a drop in the ocean. Welcome or welcome back and let's dive in. So here we go again, guys. Another case where it is said everyone knows, but no one can prove anything. Imelda's case was treated similarly to Eva Brennan's. Remember Eva? It was mentioned when Eva disappeared, she had suffered from bouts of depression from time to time. So perhaps for that reason, or perhaps for other reasons discussed, initially there was no investigation. Well, listen closely to the details of today's case. As at this point, having covered multiple cases of Ireland's missing women, there are so many parallels to be drawn between many of the cases we've covered here. And the case of Imelda Keenan is no different. It's not because they all lived inside a mysterious vanishing triangle, but that's my opinion. Please let me know if you agree or disagree or what your thoughts are by the end of today's video. And we'll do a quick recap of each case today also. Perhaps you'll notice something new. That is the whole point of what we're doing here. I will put a disclaimer here. I don't mean to disrespect or insult or upset anyone here. This is an open, ongoing case. No one has been charged, no less prosecuted or held accountable. So everyone is considered innocent until proven guilty. I have just gathered all available information regarding this case that I could find online in media reports and from videos and shout outs that Imelda's family have done. I've brought it all together to present it here to you. So let's talk about Imelda Keenan. Imelda was a quiet, shy person. She loved music and socialising, singing, dancing. She was known to be quite introverted, but she did have a small group of close friends and a really close relationship with her family. Imelda was the youngest girl of a large family with eight siblings from Manor Road in County Leash. She was innocent, 
yet wise. The heart of a child, but the mind of a wise person. By 1994, Imelda was studying computing in CTI Waterford, engaged to Mark Wall, living in her own bedsit style flat in the heart of Waterford City, less than a 20 minute drive to the ocean, which is what drew Imelda to Waterford in the first place. So Mark Wall was an older man. He was in a band called Spellbound and the band used to play in a local pub. It used to be called the Three Ships Pub. It's now Fitzwilliam Hotel, a very popular spot. So Imelda would often be hanging out there too with them even though she was younger. When Imelda was reported missing on January 3rd, no one had seen her or spoken to her for two weeks prior, apart from her fiancé Mark. But apart from him, the last piece of factual evidence relating to Imelda is the record of her collecting her social welfare payment between December 22nd and December 24th. There is nothing solid following that. We're going to go through Mark's version of events and then we'll discuss the things that don't quite add up. And that's all we have. No one has been charged or prosecuted. This is an open and ongoing case, as I said, which has gone cold. But we'll also discuss what has caused some recent activity surrounding Imelda Keenan's disappearance. On January 3rd, Mark went to Imelda's brother Ned in Ned's workplace. He told Ned Imelda is missing. He said Imelda had gotten up that morning. She had washed her hair, given Mark a cup of tea, put on her makeup and left the flat to go collect her social welfare payment from the post office, which was around six to seven minutes walk away. She never returned. Mark said Imelda left the flat for the post office between 1 and 1.30. He was telling Ned this at 4.30 on the same day. He would later also say she was a bit depressed. No one else in Imelda's life corroborates this. Imelda showed no signs of depression in anyone else's opinion. Depression is often hidden. Difficult to spot if someone is trying to hide it. But Imelda spoke openly with her family, her brothers. They firmly believe she would have discussed this with them if it was the case. She had gone for a drink with her brother two weeks before Christmas and everything was good. Imelda's family decided they should have a look in Imelda's flat because no one else was to see if there was any clues as to where Imelda might be or where she went. Mark was in the flat. There, Imelda's family would find Imelda's handbag, her beloved cat Felix, who by the way reportedly disappeared soon after. Imelda hadn't taken any clothes, any money. Her cigarettes were left there. And the biggest sign to everyone that things were not as they seemed was that Imelda's glasses were still in her flat. Imelda needed these glasses very much. Her eyesight was terrible. She always wore her glasses, only really removing them for photographs. It was strange to say the least that she would have went anywhere without her handbag and cash, but it was unbelievable she would have left without her glasses. And then... It was highly unlikely Imelda did leave to go to the post office. It was closed. It closes every day for lunch from 1pm to 2pm. Imelda was supposed to have left closer to 1pm. It's a six minute journey. And on this Bank Holiday Monday, post offices don't open. Bank Holiday Monday 1994, post offices were closed. Shops were closed. Most places were closed on a bank holiday. On a bank holiday, the country shut down. It's difficult to believe Imelda would have thought she was going to get a payment, forgetting it was a bank holiday. It's more difficult to believe that Mark also forgot, although he definitely did forget this while he was giving this excuse or reason to Ned regarding the last time he had seen Imelda, saying she was heading to the post office. There was more. This was January 3rd. The Christmas presents, Imelda's, remained unopened underneath the Christmas tree. The wreath for her father's grave was there in her flat. And there was one special thing missing that appeared to some to be the biggest red flag. Imelda's diary was absent. Mark said she didn't have a diary. We'll hear more about that in a moment. But once the Irish police were notified of Imelda's disappearance and they began taking statements, Mark informed them Imelda was a bit depressed, that she wasn't herself. As a direct result, this case, just like Eva's case, immediately became an unsuspicious case. 
Imelda's family and friends have since day one protested this, pointing to injuries Imelda had along with inconsistencies in the story so far. But Mark's comment saying Imelda was a bit depressed was the line they went with, ignoring everyone else's testimony for many years. Because of this, Imelda's close circle of friends were never even questioned. One of them went to give a statement of her own accord and a detective told her they'd get back to her. They never did. One witness came forward saying she had seen Imelda crossing the road in Waterford on the day around the time Imelda allegedly left her flat and disappeared. But this couldn't be verified. Imelda was wearing a leopard print leggings, which would have made her very visible on the street. But no one else in Waterford saw her that day. So it's widely believed it was a case of mistaken identity or just mistaken time or date. There were searches carried out, but for someone who had ended everything. Not for someone who had disappeared against their wishes or had been murdered or kidnapped. So the river shore was searched but no body was found. Searches were carried out around Waterford City of derelict buildings, back gardens, sheds, but there was no trace of Imelda. However, Imelda's flat was never forensically examined. It was never even thought of as a crime scene, never analysed. Law enforcement did request Imelda's medical records, which of course could tell a lot, as we saw in the case of Fiona Sinnott. But these records were not requested until late 2023, almost 30 years later. We don't have the details of these records yet, but the family have commented on suspicious injuries Imelda had before her disappearance at different times, mentioning a neck brace and Imelda being on crutches and lots of bandages. But they don't know why or who was hurting her. Imelda would brush it off saying, um, my bones are brittle. The family say they would like Mark's cooperation in explaining who or why Imelda was being hurt, what was going on. So we will see where that leads. Surely this urgently needs to be upgraded to a murder inquiry, where suspects can be arrested and questioned. So long as it's a missing persons inquiry, no one can be arrested. At the time of Imelda's disappearance, There were works being carried out on a building just across from Imelda's flat, so perhaps there could be a forensic examination or archaeological dig there. Then there were also some strange behaviours and allegedly a couple of very odd statements made at the time. Again, all of the following. It's already out there in the public domain. Firstly, two weeks following Imelda's disappearance, her fiancé went silent. No help from him with anything after that. He wouldn't engage with Imelda's family. There were no public appeals made by him, nothing, and he wasn't involved with any of the searches from then on. But he held on to Imelda's keys to her bedsit or her flat, and he would open Imelda's post. Now, a letter came in the post at the time following Imelda's disappearance. It was a bill for £10, which remained unpaid. Her fiancé opened this letter as he didn't give the keys back to Imelda's brother, Jerry, and was using the flat for a month. When Mark was asked why he didn't pay this bill, allegedly he said, what's the point in paying it when she won't be coming back? This was one month following his fiancé's disappearance. Unexplained disappearance. Imelda's mother naturally wanted her daughter's belongings returned to her, but it would be a year before Imelda's clothes would be returned to her mother and when they were, they were covered in chip pan oil for some reason. Allegedly, Mark was having an affair at the time Imelda disappeared. I'm mentioning this not to talk bad about anyone. It's details like these can be important to a case like this. I'm not saying it is, but it could be. Imelda's partner said Imelda and family had issues, which wasn't true. Imelda's partner told Gardie Imelda wasn't feeling herself. Mark was asked to take a lie detector but refused. Let's hear what what Imelda's niece Gina Curry had to say to the Irish Independent. She'd always have a diary and she'd always tell me how important a diary was and she'd always tell me to write everything in your diary and she bought me a diary. So Melda had one throughout for as long as I can remember but when Melda went missing also her diary went missing. We never found her diary. The 3rd of January just doesn't sit with us right and um, I don't think Melda would not talk to her brother I don't think she wouldn't ignore him at the door I don't think she would not give Christmas presents to her nephews till after Christmas and nobody opens Christmas presents in January they always might open on Christmas Eve but 
3rd of January, so it would have been the 4th of January by the time the family went down to the apartment. And her cat was there, the presents were there, her glasses were there, Melda was gone and her diary was gone. It just makes us feel that we're not being told the truth. I would like for anyone to come forward. If they saw Melda at Christmas, um, if they saw her on St. Stephen's Day or New Year's Day, just to come and tell us because we don't know where she was for two weeks for Christmas. So if she was not out and she was in her flat, why did she not open the door to her brother? You know, that just doesn't make sense to me. And we all know when the post office is going to be open at Christmas. We all know when our next payment is, you know, people, anyone that's on social welfare. Mel, like it was a bank holiday, why would she go there? And how, like, would you know by half four that someone is a missing person if they leave between one and half one? I just don't feel like it's the truth. And I, I just want the truth. The family want the truth. I also heard Imelda's niece Gina questioning why Mark's circle of friends, who had also been Imelda's circle of friends, denied knowing Imelda following her disappearance. And their band subsequently split up within two weeks. So what's going on? Coincidence? Perhaps. Does Mark feel he needs to cover for someone? Was Imelda abducted, kidnapped by someone she didn't know and whisked off? Or was she hurt by someone she knew, someone from her circle of friends or someone closer to her? Or did she run away to start a new life somewhere without her handbag, her money, her clothes, her cigarettes, her glasses? She didn't even own a passport, so she didn't leave the country. Or did she decide to end everything without any reasons no, or any warning signs? What do you think? Multiple searches have been carried out over the years when the Irish police would get a tip from the public but there has never been a trace found of Imelda. January 2023, Gardaí made a public appeal for any information regarding Imelda Keenan's disappearance. Superintendent Tony Lundergan of Waterford Garda Station. And I'm here today to ask for the public assistance uh, on the 29th anniversary of the disappearance of Imelda Keenan. Now, Imelda was last seen on the 3rd of January 1994 on the Mal, the key area of Waterford City. I'm asking the public if they have any information, no matter how trivial they may think it is, to contact us here at Waterford Garda Station on 051 30 5300 to use the Garda Confidential Line 1800 666 or indeed, if you have any information, to call to any other Garda Station. Again, I'd just like to thank you all very much for your assistance. In 2023, a witness came forward with potentially significant information. This is why publicity for these cases is so important, regardless of how long it has been, how much time has passed. This woman knew Imelda before she disappeared. She had no idea Imelda had disappeared, as this woman had moved from the area at the time. In 2023, she saw a programme highlighting Ireland's missing women and contacted the Irish police with information. Of course, we don't know the details she provided the police, but allegedly it's regarding a number of unsettling incidences before Imelda's disappearance. Imelda's family met with law enforcement following this, but the case remains to be a missing persons case. It needs to be upgraded to a murder investigation. That might just happen shortly because it was following the new witness coming forward that law enforcement requested Imelda's medical records. So at least this case seems to be active in some capacity at the moment. Imelda's family have constantly been working on it themselves, gathering information, passing anything they can get onto law enforcement. But now with this new witness, things are beginning to hopefully happen. Imelda's niece, Gina Carey, campaigns endlessly across social media platforms. She runs the Facebook group Imelda Keenan, Murdered or Missing. And Imelda's brother Jerry continues to campaign endlessly behind the scenes, dealing with radio interviews and a lot more. Imelda's family have erected a plaque on a bridge in Waterford and they gather there for a vigil every year on January 3rd, even though they strongly suspect Imelda was missing days prior to this date. Here's Imelda's brother Jerry at this year's vigil. 2024. Who would ever think that we'd be standing here talking about my sister who went missing 30 years ago? Please come forward with that little bit of information. We need it. We need it now. 
We're not looking for revenge. We never, the Keenan family never spoke about revenge for the 30 years that I have campaigned. All is we wanted was to bring our sister home. Home to rest with my parents. Home to rest with my brother that's in Ballybeck, in the graveyard in Ballybeck. The following is from a book called Death by Domestic Violence and it's by Catherine Van Warmer and Albert R. Roberts. This is from the chapter titled Risk Factors for Domestic Homicide and it's from the section The Psychology of Domestic Homicide, Men Who Kill. Two relevant personality types are described in the literature of domestic homicide. The first is the personality disorder and to social personality. Men in this category lack normal emotions such as love, jealousy or the ability to feel empathy or remorse. So when they kill, they do so not out of jealousy but because they want to get rid of the person or for financial gain. The second personality type of batterers that Jacobson and Gottman identified in their experiment, they called pit bulls. These men were found to become internally aroused with heart rates that increased with their anger. They never let up. The wives of pit bulls often took the risk of arguing back. If the women ever left the relationship, such men tended to stalk them. In his classic work on violence, former prison psychiatrist James Gilligan describes one man whom he saw as typical of wife murderers in general. This inmate, Walter T, had an image of himself as a dependent, helpless infant who expected his wife to nurture him so he would not die. When she threatened to leave him, therefore, he experienced it as the equivalent of a death threat. And so he decided to kill her, regardless of the consequences to himself. One theme that dominates the criminal justice literature is the theme of jealousy and possessiveness. In his work with battering men, Dutton found that fear of abandonment was common. Assaultive males in our treatment groups talked about jealousy and abandonment a great deal in treatment, even while trying to maintain a distanced, cool or dismissing tone about their emotional dependence on their wives. When responding to scenarios in which the woman wanted to spend time with their friends, violence-prone men reported themselves anxious and angry, even feeling humiliated. I feel this is quite relevant to quite a lot of our vanishing triangle, missing women. I'd like to know how you feel. We've seen how, unfortunately, there was a pattern of sorts here. Many of these women seem to have disappeared at the hands of someone known to them, very well known to them, whether that be an abusive partner, an abusive ex or a local predator. There are so many details so similar across all of these cases in the so-called vanishing triangle. That term, the vanishing triangle, look at how many people that has covered for. Most people still believe the missing women of Ireland's vanishing triangle were all victims of a serial killer. But I hope you can now see that's simply not the case. They seem to have disappeared at the hands of their partner, ex-partner or local creep. There are multiple YouTube videos and podcasts on the missing women of Ireland. I recommend them all. The more publicity these cases can get, the better. You never know what information is going to unfold. Everyone has a different slant on things. So go watch, listen, learn. The Missing Women of Ireland, or Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. Annie McCarrick had been physically assaulted in the weeks prior to her disappearance in Dublin. Her case has been upgraded to a murder inquiry. Eva Brennan was involved in a prayer group which appears to have had sinister connections in Rathfarnham, Dublin. Eva's case is a missing persons case. Fiona Pender, County Offaly, heavily pregnant, was last seen by her abusive partner John Thompson, who now resides in Canada. Fiona's case was upgraded to a murder inquiry. Fiona Sinnott's hospital records show how she was last seen by her abusive ex, Sean Carroll, in Wexford. Her case was upgraded to a murder inquiry. 17-year-old Kira Breen in Dundalk disappeared out her bedroom window to meet local creep 35-year-old Liam Mullen. 
Her case was upgraded to a murder inquiry, but the main suspect is now deceased. And Imelda Keenan, known as Mel to those close to her, disappeared either December 93 or January 94. Her case is still a missing persons case 30 years later. Most of these people were last seen by someone close to them, people who have reason to be suspects. Detective Alan Bailey said Operation Trace helped them establish in the cases of Fiona Pender, Fiona Sinnott and Kira Breen. It's well known who murdered these people, but they have been given rock solid alibis by people close to them. And that is the problem. Not necessarily the fact that there's no body or no crime scene, it's the false alibis. They need to be retracted and the truth told. That was only for Operation Trace. I think the same can be said for most of the other victims that we've covered here, but not all. That leaves Jojo Dollard, who vanished while hitchhiking home to Kilkenny from Nace, and Deirdre Jacob, who vanished from her garden gate in Newbridge. There was a monster on the loose in Ireland at the time. So in our next and final episode in this series, we'll dive into the case of Larry Murphy. And we'll mention another few monsters at the time too. A huge thank you to everyone for following this series and a special thanks to my subscribers. I can't express how much it means to me that you are here with me looking into these cases. So thank you very much. I'll see you soon. Take care. Good luck and bye bye.